This is the poet in the poem from the Library of Congress. I'm Grace Cavalieri, and Tony Mall's book was the award recipient from the Washington Writers Publishing House. It was the Gene Feldman Award, and they are going to read a poem. Tony, let's hear a poem. Great. This is one of the title poems from the book. You cannot save here. The first day of the end, I don't do anything. Just sit in the dimness of midday room with unopened blinds. Lament the lack of energy needed to fry up egg alternative. Open the fridge more frequently than is practical. Eventually, a sun shower taps on the porch, breaking through soot-soaked sky. And the small dog at my feet needs a walk, so we suit up each in mismatched Macintosh, and along the way, duck sauce couplets bloom from tossed off takeout bag while broken warblers call out car alarm songs. In the distance, I mistake discarded t-shirt caught on almost budded branch for late spring's first heron. The end sounds so familiar like, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down today, mm. like Sunday like a half gone song. Mm. Dr. Tony Maul. That was a sun shower for sure. That mm. poem. <laughs> what is the title of this book? The title is You Cannot Save Here. And there are like 28, I think, poems that share that title with the book. Um, what does the title mean? It's a whole bunch of stuff, actually. It's, um, it's uh, certainly a nod to like, technology and like both video games and computer files telling you this is not a place you can save your progress um, but it's also meant to nod to the apocalyptic themes of the book being unable to preserve the things we're losing um, in an environmental sense but also in like a social sense um, and then certainly it's meant to invoke a little bit of like religiosity too and the idea of like what is saved or savable oh yes tony <laughs> the thing is that it is the work of art saves us. And that is always mm. the contradiction I love so much that we can talk about an apocalypse, but the very talking about it said beautifully, yeah. make, you know, say it clear and make it beautiful, which mm. is what you did. Why do you think it won the prize? Um, you know, I don't know. I think some of the compliments I've gotten both from, from the press and from others that I've been touring on it is that it's so um, diverse in its approach to poetry. Mm. Like I'm blending both like high culture and low culture. I'm doing free verse and prose poetry and fixed forms all together. Um, and it's all, all in one place, right? Mm. So there's a mm. lot of different angles from which I'm viewing poetry and its possibilities. And I hope that's the strength of the work and that's some of the feedback I've gotten on it. Well. I think you have said it so well. It Thank is, you. it has so, it's eclectic, but yet it's unified. There's mm. symmetry and it is diverse. So it's a very complex, but beautifully put together book. And we're going Thank to hear you. some more from it. In fact, give us two, then we'll know. Sure. That. And this is That's Dr. A... Tony Mall. Thank you. I'm going to read another one. It shares the same title. You cannot save here. This one is after um, Mary Oliver, the poet, and John Berger, who is an artist and art commentator. Um, you cannot save here. Whole blocks give way to blight, and I darn my favorite sweater. I'm lying. I pay someone to darn my favorite sweater. I'm lying. I buy a new sweater, assuming endless supply. Skip my long run day and stay indoors. Watch ways of seeing while working out a body I can't save in the long run. A body I can't afford to resolve and won't before the walls rot. The top of the world packs up and goes more quickly than we predict. I'm grinding experience points. The mirror sends me on a side quest. I clutch my gut like a hamburger, murmur 180 by April. Hail Mary, full of grace, I keep trying to do the one wild and precious life thing. Make something lavender of the hooded crow's wailing cries. Fold together a family of lovers who know the most poetic ways of barricading the doors. We get on with it as the fires start. Focus on breathing. Anything sacred, 
the holiness of hands, of hand jobs, of starting gardens of garlic, climbing through the floorboards, more tender names for orgies, for Aprils, for the last time the earth bows to the sun. Beautiful. <clears throat> Let's have one more. Absolutely. This also shares a title. This is You Cannot Save Here. And this one's after Lars van Trier and particularly his film Melancholia. Um, the book has a lot of apocalyptic themes. And part of that is that I really immersed myself in apocalyptic literature. Mm. And there's this beautiful film, uh, Melancholia. Um, and this is sort of after that film. You Cannot Save Here. My favorite apocalypse starts with an orphan planet, starts with a wedding, starts with a star somewhere south of where it should be. My favorite apocalypse knows sadness refuses to work for circumstance, but who wouldn't want washed in lavish sorrow to spend the end tucked in taffeta gown as the sky bows to kiss an emerald lawn like vow bound believer. When we collide, I want sent off as my worst self, wrapped in black basque, riding a cross-eyed cub caught in sand trap, unvexed by end times hailstorm. My favorite apocalypse consolidates, water bottle, mm -hmm. takeout straw, SIM card, Chemex, combustion engine, fast fashion black jacket, apple orchard, firstborn, not a breath left to ask, are you happy? Aren't you happy? Of course, you are saving at the same time. You know mm. you're saving us. So vital and so brilliant, your work. Thank you so much. I want to tell them that your memoir, Out of Step, won the Lambda Literary Award in Bisexual Nonfiction. And when was that? Um, that book came out in 2018. So I won it for the 2018 year. So um, you're on a roll. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, two books, two big awards. It was Don't stop pretty now. meaningful to me. You've got, yeah. whole, you've got a lot left of this decade yet. You can pull yeah. in a few more. Are you writing <laughs> every day? I don't. I wish I did write every day. I'm thinking about writing every day and I'm reading every day and I'm taking little notes every day. But the truth is, it's a little slower for me. I, maybe uh, once a week, twice a week is when I'm actually cutting out time to say, this is writing time. I'm actually at the page. Um, and yeah, I know that, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, 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 it's a practice. It's a regular practice. I wish it were a little more frequent personally. Um, and I encourage my students to be much more frequent than that, but it is sort of what I've developed recently. But Tony, you're teaching that takes enormous primary energy. Yeah. Um, and I have to say that the Washington Writers Publishing House made a very good choice for this yeah. award. Um, the more I read it, the more intricate. You had me at the taffeta gown, I have to say. You had me <laughs> at the taffeta gown. Now, when I met you in the Enoch Pratt Library, yeah. you were Anthony. And yeah. then I talked to you and you said, there's been a big change in my life. Yeah. Tell us what that change is and how it affects your writing. Yeah, sure. So about a year ago, I started medical transition towards a more feminine appearance. Um, I went, uh, I changed my name to a name I started, I went by when I was younger. Um, and I started hormones. I started a uh, hormone replacement therapy. Um, and that um, I, I knew when I was envisioning the process, it would have an effect on my writing. But it's been pretty significant, both the writing I'm doing now, which um like the writing I'm doing now in my first year of medical transition is very much about transition, of course. But what's interesting is that it's changed my relationship to my previous writing. It changed my relationship to You Cannot Save Here, um, to Out of Step, um, and how I, you know, all of those books are about gender in a variety of ways. Um, so it's still the same theme. Um, it's just from a different position within that theme. But your artist core remains the same so yeah I, I th yeah think, yeah i think the tone and the mood may vary but yeah. there is a, a, essentially a thread in you which is anthony tony the artist mm. and i think you're going to write from that from your soul right yeah i think so i think because like my work was about gender even before i tra started transitioning my work both before and after i started is also about like 
class and this chip mm-hmm. on my shoulder being like a queer working class writer and a queer working class professor. Um, those things remain true regardless of my like gender presentation. Well, it hasn't hurt your award ability <laughs> <laughs> because you received the Adele Holden Award for Creative Excellence and the mm-hmm. Bill Knott Poetry Prize, nominations for the Push Card, the Best of the Net. You have an MFA in Creative Writing and a PhD. What did your PhD get you and why did you do it? Yeah, so I think after my MFA, um, I, I, lo- I was looking at the market. I knew, you know, some people coming out of the MFA, they just want to write. And some people, some of us know we want to teach. And I was looking at the market and seeing how competitive it was. And I was like, you know, I want to teach both writing and literature. Um, it makes me more competitive. Let me start there. Let me look at a PhD program. Um, and so in my PhD, I took more workshops in poetry. Um, what and is I was your able PhD? to also- What's it, what it's called? Um, <laughs> what a are PhD you? in English and the concentration is in writing and rhetoric. Um, yeah. And so workshops in, in poetry, but also these like my research interests too. So like feminist and queer studies and multicultural literature. And that strengthened me as a scholar. But I also think that scholarship really strengthens me as a writer as mm. well. So oh, I did it for the sake of the market, but ultimately it really benefited my writing um, and like my identity as an artist and as a scholar too. People don't know when you assign yourself to those years, um, postgraduate years, how yeah. very much of a sacrifice you make yeah. because yeah. materially, emotionally, I mean, it's like jumping through a fiery hoop every day. People yeah. don't realize the value of it, but Dr. Maul is a kind of a nice name. And let us have two poems together from this (laughs) award winning book. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, it is nice. It's a nice gender neutral honorific doctor. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, This is how to write a love poem during a plague. And it was written during COVID, of course. First, don't. But remember that this too shall be settled, accepted one day as standard, an intimacy absent of the sweat and ugly scents that make it. Discover you miss stripping off a pit-soaked t-shirt between unceasing lips. Next, try not to fall for somebody new. And if you do, I guess the talk about safer sex sounds different unless you survive the 80s. You know what? Just wash your hands or learn to long or fuck long distance. I don't know what day it is, but the moon is still waxing, even if you and I have stopped shaving. Finally, go ahead and say it. I've worn this hoodie for four days and I miss you, I think. I like the equivocal ending. Yeah, (laughs) thank you. Give us another um, uh, a, a company piece. Absolutely. So this one is another from this sort of the second half of the book that is about um, this, the 2020, really, that year we're all inside. Um, it's after Rilke, the poet, and Fauci, the public health official. It's also titled You Cannot Save Here. After 148 days inside, stacked, end to end, from hoodie and heater to straining central air, I reconsider the body problem. On one hand, who needs hands? A rib cage stuffed with disquiet, the soft tissue of desire, the dark center where the narrative gets jammed up. But fuck, do you remember the four of us and both dogs tucked into a hatchback, howling dolly lyrics till we went raspy? Or do you recall stone soup picnics in the park, the mosquitoes mauling my leg as we passed my favorite gay poems back and forth in the grass? You held open the thin book with one hand, pulled a pit from your sucking lips with the other. I used the index fingernail to press tiny crosses into the raised pink of my skin. If I were to write a critical analysis of your work, I would entitle it Rilke and Fauci. <laughs> that is the Thank way you put two disparate things together and you. make fireworks, right? Yeah. You know, oh. I asked you if if you would do us the favor of taking apart a poem 
and showing us what went on with Tony Mall's head. When did you get the idea for the poem? How did you enter it? How hard, what did you have to overcome? So what I think it'd be best if you read the poem first and then yeah. parsed it for us because people love to know what's going on underneath that lavender cap of yours. Yeah. Um, that's great. Yeah. So this is another you cannot save here and I'll read it and then talk about my process generally and specifically. Excellent. And it came to pass in those days, a certain soccer team made us forget how wicked our flags were while outside on my block, two wise women hunched on the stoop became one lowly woman on a stoop. What I'm saying is the end takes his time. Summer slogs on with mid-Atlantic malice, while somewhere deep in the city park, ungentle waterfowl swallow Frito-Lay lily pads and sing nothing. I crave in the shade and hope for a less cruel collapse, swipe right and wait for sundown. I cannot tell you what to name me after dark in a pile of final months. I only know that I don't identify as the moon or the night, but as silhouette of blackbird against slate dark sky over row home hornus. What I'm saying is I was just out walking and I'm scared and love lock the door, lock mm -hmm. the door. Where were you when you felt to write that? This one's really interesting because um, this, I started writing, some of my most generative space is out walking. So I live in Hamden, which is a neighborhood here in Baltimore. And I walk a lot. It's my primary mode of working out. It's just walking around the neighborhood for a couple hours, listening to an audiobook or a podcast. I've certainly listened to episodes of this podcast on it. Um, and just like, um, something about movement will bring ideas to me. So some of those things, the two old women on the stoop, um, the Frito-Lay lily pads, um, those are things that came from being out walking around my city and just jotting in the notes app in my phone, basically. And they sort of live there just as like uh, disparate uh, images um, until I was writing during um, during 2020. And one night in particular where um, really late, you know, kept weird hours then, really late, I um, was um, just out walking my dog and it just was so still and that stillness really like inspiring some images and some feelings in me. Um, and that ended up being sort of the fuel that actually brought it together, the 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 glue that brought it all together. And I sort of drafted the full poem from that along with these images that were elsewhere and tied them together. And then I have a really robust revision process in that I have a writing group a, that meets regularly, of friends um, from my MFA program who stay in touch and meet regularly. Um, I have like a first reader, my spouse is my first reader. So I get feedback from her. Um, and so I have a really robust process of revision that even after a draft takes me, I don't know, four months, five months um, before a poem comes together. And all of that as well before it ever gets to like something like a contest submission and working with the editors. One of the magic things about Washington Writers Publishing House is that because it's a collective, the winners each year get full manuscript feedback from anywhere to like six to 10 brilliant, skilled, educated poets already on the press. And that's unparalleled it's so cool so all of that long process took place before that ever happened and then yeah once the book got picked up I also got full um full manuscript feedback that affected uh, affected a lot of poems in a really positive way too we have to have a shout out to Caroline and yeah. Jonas because they have really mounted a new a new dimension to the publishing house yeah. that's amazing what you're saying yeah, so, they're doing so much work. And in addition to that feedback, it's just like for this independent press of that's volunteer staff to do as much work as they do is incredible, right? Like um, my first book is published with the literary imprint of an academic press, well-funded, university-funded press. 
Um, and I love them. They're incredible. I'm not talking trash about them at all, but like what Carolyn did as a volunteer editor in chief or president, co-president, the way she set up the tour, the promotional work she did, the outreach work she did ahead of publication was significantly more. It's, it's really impressive that this, what this model does. Caroline is a passion on legs and yeah. we're so grateful <laughs> to have them. And uh, so grateful to have those presidents. So yeah. let us ha have another poem because I think we're getting to understand who you are at a very, very deep level. I, I'm really getting more than when I read your work. Interestingly, sometimes it doesn't matter hearing it. It's just another phase. But when yeah. you read your work, those words have become three-dimensional. Yeah. So let's hear another piece. Thank you so much. And the book um, is yeah. You Cannot Save Here. Yeah, this is another poem titled You Cannot Save Here. The 700th day of the end, I don't do anything. Let my circadian rhythm slip loose by rising with the midday hum of lunch rush bustle outside city window. Sweater weather in December suggests the end continues to sputter along slowly enough we don't panic at its approach. I roll myself out of plush nest and pour an afternoon coffee as winter spills the golden hour early and I spring myself into evening, then night, then the hours when even the moon puts her phone away. When I'm feeling like the only person left on a broken planet. Sometimes I keep the lights out, stand in the center of carpeted blue rooms during the witching hour, wonder what I'm doing with myself. And it's not that we were wrong about it all coming down. It's that we've gotten used to it. No sudden flood, no final kiss, just a slow goodbye of ice in a sweating rocks glass here than less here than not here. Mooney, I understand the beauty you give dystopia, but mm. don't you truly believe that as long as we have each other as artists, that there is that, that flame at the temple that will never go out? I, I mean, do, I think that's, other. yeah. I think that's why I find Apocalypse so fascinating is that, for so many peoples, um, we've found community and comradeship and um, an image of a future together as it's collapsed, right? The way artists or queer people or women of all sort rally around each other when times get tough. Um, it's those times getting tough show us that we can survive and help us imagine new futures. So yeah, I think the arts and the way oh we build and envision, um, it's both a response to it and hopefully a balm for tough times. Tony, it's immortality. The artists are the ones who create civilization and crumbling mm. buildings can't actually touch that. Mm. So mm. I love the fact that we're all part of a tribe that endures. Yeah. And yeah. One thing I want to know is why on your resume you put they are a Gemini. <laughs> what does that mean I, to you? Yeah, I, I added it to my bio recently. It's really interesting because I'm not a particularly like uh, religious, spiritual person. Um, but in the last year or two, I've um, I've embraced it, even if I'm not like believing in like a material astrology. Um I still think it's um I still think it's a really beautiful fear signifier mm. to talk about it. Um and so Anything. that's a new addition that I added my my zodiac there. <laughs> I know. It's being in love with the invisible, which we yeah. all can't we oh, have to have we yeah. have to have that. And yeah. now we have to have a final poem. Absolutely. By Dr. This is Dr. Tony Mall. Thank you so much. This is a longer one. Um, and it's, you cannot save here. They're not all titled that, but there are a lot of those in the book. Um, and it's after another apocalyptic film. Um, and it starts with an epigraph from that film, from the film Beast of the Southern Wild, um, and from a character named Hush Puppy in that film. 
For the animals that didn't have a dad to put them in the boat, the end of the world already happened. You cannot save here. One, the truth is a group of crows is called whatever you want, poet. Call it a flock, name it a summer, an apocalypse, a sacred text. I ask my students to turn down the volume, then I go home, get high, write about doomsday fires blinking on the horizon. Two, consider the hummingbird corpse I saw on campus today, just outside the tall windows that welcome light into our classroom. Its faded plumage no longer a shimmer in the air, but avocado green and black, barely a smear on flecked asphalt. Three, the end is gorgeous, like everything that can kill us. Scorpion, palisade, maybells, oil rainbowing the surface of the sea. Four, the horse chestnut down past the post office fills with a hundred corvids. So I take the long way around. Having left my glasses at home, I look up, mistake starlings in the brass light for bats who roost beneath the interstate. Five, our resolve takes a form of tattoos, hog or cock or FEMA X code, a mark to remind us of a shore somewhere still out of sight. Six, the truth is the end happens all the time, every day, a diagnosis, an eviction, a bullet, a bullet, a bullet. Seven, and something waits for us in the bottom of the crock pot soup you started before the emergency alert squealed from your phone. Eight, I introduce you to a board game about the end of days and you laugh, ask if it's called Monopoly. Nine, I use vacant as a noun. My city fills with red brick row home plywood windows bandaging abandoned pasts. 10, the truth is our dog is going to slow us down and may be a barrier for entry at northern border crossings. Her chipped smile justifies the risk, and we ask ourselves what weight is worth drowning trying to carry home. 11. Every bird becomes a vulture, every animal a scavenger, every tooth in our clutch of pearls shaped to tear. 12. The truth is the end, isn't here yet. The truth is the end, has already begun. 13. Vigilant on the concrete lip, the blackbird remains unfazed by the panic of footsteps slapping across the parking lot. The voice of Tony Mall, and this is the poet and the poem from the Library of Congress. The program is produced by Forest Woods Media Productions, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making the program possible. Funding is provided by the Ravada Foundation of the Logan Family, by Sinipid Fund, the Maryland State Arts Council, Natalie Canavour, and Sandy Jackson-Cohen. Mike Turpin is our engineer, and I'm Grace Cavalieri.